is Karen Wood Serrano. She is the Director of Collection and Development and Scholarly Communication at the OU Libraries. Today she is going to discuss the building of online institutional repository here at OU. Uh, so for all of us, this is going to be very engaging. Please welcome Karen. Thank you, Alicia. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Um, over the past year or so, the University Libraries has brought up a new commercial product that we acquired in order to provide an institutional repository. And over the past few years, we have had digital collections. We have them in a system that we had built ourselves, which meant that it was built for specific kinds of things and it you know, wasn't particularly robust. Um, we picked a product that was on the market that would allow us to deal with uh, a greater variety of content um, and hopefully ingest more content at a more rapid pace as well. So um, that product is called Content DM. You actually find the product on our website, so at libraries.ou.edu, under our resources tab, there is a link for digital collections. Digital collections are where our institutional repository resides. Now, we have put some of our own special collections material in here to get things started. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here. So, for example, uh, we have the Bass Business Collections. That means we have Print materials we digitize, but we also have things like oral histories. So you can actually hear oral histories from different business people or specialists in the field. So we have audio files as well. Go back another screen here. In our history of science collections, we have um, scanned in some particular uh, materials of importance to start with. So we have. Uh, a copy of Copernicus's work, which includes his his notes in, in the margins. Uh, we have some ebooks from our history of science collection. We have some online galleries of art and portraits. And interestingly, we've uh, started photographing some scientific instruments as well, so you can actually see those items. So much for <laughs> so much for technology today. There we go. It works just like you thought it was going to. It always does. So let me see if I can get back to where we were. And uh, let's talk a little more specifically about institutional repositories as they apply to uh, faculty here on campus. Part of our institutional repository is Sooner Scholar, and this is where we intend to be loading scholarly communications material. We have four, four items in here right now to start, so we are uh, at the smallest of baby steps at the moment. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about institutional repositories in general. Um, what is an institutional repository? What is that concept? Uh, SPARC, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, uh, defines institutional repository as digital collections that capture and preserve the intellectual output of university communities. These repositories can provide a way for university authors to provide broader access to their publications. And that's what Sooner Scholar is designed to do. Now, um, if you're already publishing, you may say to yourself, why? Why do I want to do it? I have already have my articles published in, uh, in professional journals. Well, 
Um, the idea is that what we put here will be accessible beyond what's in the journal. So frequently when you publish in a journal, the only way another person gets access to it is if they have a personal subscription, if their institution has an institutional subscription, um, and frequently in the developing world, um, deeper access is given on a, a much cheaper basis in order to bring those countries into the scholarly community. Um, and that's who gets access to it. But if you want your work to be accessible to a wider range, then an institutional repository is one way to go about that. Uh, when we put material in here, it's given a persistent URL, which means that that's not going, you know, even if things migrate, change, that's going to stay the same. So we're handling that for you. You don't need to worry about broken links. Um, it means other people can get to your <coughs> material without error. And it's going to show up in Google and other search engines. So if someone in Indonesia is looking for something on your topic and they're going to find you, they're going to be able to go to our repository and read that material. It's going to up citation rates. Okay. Uh, there have been studies done in the information science literature about material that's available in institutional repositories and open access, and those materials tend to be cited more heavily because they're available. People cite what they can find, and they cite what's available. So here's the trick. You want to, you, if I if I sold you on this, then the next step is how does this work for you as a scholar? Well, it's very important that you retain your copyright. That's the first thing. If, you, uh, if you're in the middle of something or you've got something published and you're starting to you submitted it, it's been accepted, you've got an author's agreement that you're working on, <coughs> you want to re try to retain your copyright at that point. Uh, do you have to be a legal eagle to do that? No, you do not. There are websites. Let me uh, pass this handout to you because it has some URLs on it. There are copyright addenda available out on the web for you to use. Uh, one uh, is called uh, the Science Commons or the Creative Commons license. SPARC, the organization that I uh, mentioned earlier, they also have a SPARC author addendum. Any of those would work. And basically what that addendum does is you go ahead and you sign the author agreement that, uh, or you, that your publisher has given you, and you also sign the addendum, which basically uh, is going to then reserve to you your copyright for certain purposes, including putting it repository, being able to use it in your classroom, teaching, and so on and so forth. Um, different publishers handle those agenda differently. Okay. Some of them are going to be open to that. Some of them are not going to be crazy about it. So you may have to do some negotiating with them. Uh, but I would encourage you to at least try retaining your copyright. Now, um, I know this is not an easy discussion to have with scholars because you need to publish and you want to publish in the journals that have the most prestige in your fields. I respect that and that's why I say you need to try to do this. If a publisher will not, then you need to make a decision as to whether it's important to you to be published there and you're willing to give away your copyright, or if it's more important to you to retain your copyright and to go somewhere else. It becomes difficult when you're coming up for tenure, that's a difficult decision to make. And I freely admit that this discussion is really only a small portion of a larger discussion which the library cannot, the library can offer information on that discussion, but we can't, we can't wave a magic wand and change that discussion. And that larger discussion is the tenure and promotion process at the university. 
what people expect you to publish and, and where, um, and beyond that, your professional society, and academia as a whole. It would be nice if we could all agree to be on the same page and do this today, and publishers would have no choice but to accept that. Um, but realistically speaking, we know that it doesn't, you know, it's hard enough to get faculty in one department to all go in the same direction, let alone faculty all across a state or the U.S. or the world. So we're having to work, you know, we're having to think of the publishers as a, a really big creature. And we each have, a, you know, one sphere. And we're, you know, we're poking and poking and poking it in the hopes that we can get its attention or poking up holes that eventually we will, we will do something there. So. First thing, retain your copyright. Right, Michelle? Every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second thing is if your items have already been published, you want to try to go back to the publisher and negotiate the ability to put your material into an institutional repository. If that's the case, you should feel free to contact the University Libraries to contact me and I will do everything I can to assist you in that negotiation. I'm accustomed to negotiating with publishers. I do it on sort of a different plane because I'm generally negotiating to get access to their materials at the best price. Um, but I, frequently I have a relationship with them that may be able to assist. Um, some publishers will allow you to retain the pre or post publication version without their formatting into an institutional repository. And there's a website, Sherpa, where you can find out what the publisher policies are. So it, it sounds deceptively simple in practice. Retain your copyright. Send us your item. We will put it in here. We will maintain the URL. It will be accessible. Your citation rates will rise. You will be a star. Um, but in reality, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, and really, it's a, it, that is the, that's the basis of what I had to say to you today about institutional repositories. We have an institutional repository. We encourage you to place your material into our institutional repository. You can contact me, or you can contact our coordinator of digital initiatives, Brian Schultz, and we can help you with that process when you have material that's ready to go in. And try to help you negotiate if you're in the process of negotiating as well. Um, we are certainly looking to build that institutional repository. And we want you to think as you're writing about that. Question? Karen, would it be appropriate to put uh, doctoral dissertations and master's thesis in here, or is that available elsewhere? Currently, the university works with University Microfilms um, at ProQuest particular for the dissertation abstracts database. And so when those materials are submitted electronically to them, then we don't have the ability to put them in an institutional repository. That's a discussion that will have to happen at the graduate college level and above about whether we decide at some point that we can no longer submit dissertations electronically to ProQuest and start to put them in our own institutional repository, or sometimes it's called an ETD, Electronic Thesis and Dissertations product. Um, master's theses would be a much more likely candidate, because we do not do that, we do not work with ProQuest on master's theses. The trick then becomes, um, we have, we have, the universities made a decision that they wouldn't submit master's theses, because they felt like master's theses a lot of times weren't weren't something that, that the world as a whole wants. But maybe if we had them freely accessible, they would become something that people would want and would be much more useful. So that's a good question. And that's one possibility for the for, uh, university libraries to pursue on campus with other hands. Yes? But this all academics that are going in here are expected to be publications or have a series of works. Um, I will put a couple of questions. 
If you created something that was not considered for publication, but that you wanted to have in an institutional repository, we can certainly discuss that with you. We certainly could. Now, I want to make, this is not really a place where data sets would be held. Because this kind of repository really is not robust enough for that sort of work. But certainly, uh, recently, uh, IT and the university libraries have started having conversations about those large data sets. Because, of course, we know that data management plans are being required by the NSF. And so the university also has things in place to start handling those large collections of data as well. But it won't, would not be in this sort of resource. Other questions? You mentioned a persistent URL. Will that require an OUID to get to? This system is designed so that we can put some things behind a wall that would require OUID and other things to be openly accessible without the OUID. So we would expect a majority of the kinds of things that we would see go into this repository to be open. We would expect to see relatively few items go behind an OUID section. We are going to have some things like that, but they tend to be things that we as a university library have purchased. It might be a PDF uh, document that's marketing data, for example, and we're required to not to only have it for current OU students, faculty, and staff, so we put it behind that, that ID wall. Other questions? Um, there are some And I walked over the last minute because I was in the middle of something. So I will uh, bring over to the University Libraries table. We have some pamphlets from uh, Spark that talk about authors' rights. That, uh, if you're interested in learning more about those addendum and how they work, uh, that information will be here in a few minutes because I'll, I'll walk right over to the library and bring some over to the table. Okay, before I close, I'm here. I'm a captive speaker. Are there any other questions you might have about the university libraries in general? Mark, um, don't you feel the open access journals are kind of taking this battle and doing a better job of it, maybe fighting the traditional publishing copyright grammars rather than institutional repositories? Well, yes, I think they're, they're a much they're a much more frontal assault than this is, definitely. I think the, the library committee's community is just at a point where any tool that we can get in our hands that we think will make a difference, we're willing to try to apply it. Um, so we support the open access movement. Uh, we support a number of open access publications by subscribing to them. Uh, for example, uh, we're a member of PLOS, the Public Library of Science, and as a result, that means for our faculty, if they publish in PLOS, they get a reduced publication fee on that when they have to submit and pay those, char those charges. Um, so we're doing some of that as well. We're just taking anything we can to try to get a handle on this situation with publishers. Bunch of you know, if it were a collection, 
then we would sit down and work with you on the metadata to make sure that we were using accurate terminology so the people in your field would find that material. We like to think that we have a special expertise. We spent years with specialized vocabularies in libraries. We're attempting to bring that to bear in this arena. Okay, if there are no other questions, I thank you very much for your time and attention today. Go out and spread the good work.